Good morning, everyone. Can you hear me in the back? Yes. Okay, good, thank you. All right, well, uh, thanks for being here with us this morning. Uh, my name is Carrie Creelman. I'm the head of Liaison Services. This is Nancy Linden. She's the coordinator of collections, and Nora Detloff, the uh, head of research materials procurement at the University of Houston Libraries. And we are going to talk with you this morning about re-envisioning collections at our institution. So before we dive in, by a quick show of hands, how many of you are satisfied with your collections structures, workflows, processes at your institution? Okay. How many of you are actively engaged in any level of re-envisioning your collection structures? Okay. <laughs> I didn't even keep going with that one. All right, good. So we're all in this together and hopefully we'll be learning from each other today. A little bit about us. We're a large state institution. We're the biggest in Houston of our more than 46,000 students, around 6,000 are graduate or professional students. We are an R1 university, which means we have a high level of research activity. And to support our teaching and learning and research mission, we have about 52 librarians and 112 staff. So think about how that compares to your local institution and uh, we'll move ourselves along. Today, we're going to talk about some of the factors that were the catalysts for change at UH, uh, what those changes were, both from the philosophical level as well as the practical perspective, and how we're engaging in change management. We'll also talk a little bit about our lessons learned and have some takeaways that will hopefully be applicable to your institutions. Now, we've had a lot of change in the last couple of years. So we will not even try to talk about it in any chronological order or go into too much, too much depth of detail, uh, but we'll focus on the, the takeaways. And by all means, we're happy to answer any questions that you have for more information. So as we consider, uh, as you consider our content today, we hope that you'll think about your local institution. Think about the global factors that we're all dealing with, but also identify the factors that you can turn into opportunities at your university. Throughout the presentation, we'll prompt you to think about your long, local context, and we encourage you to jot down some of the questions that we ask for further reflection later. So, these are some of, probably not a comprehensive list, but some of the issues that are affecting us all when it comes to managing our collections budgets. These are things that we're all thinking about, talking about, you're probably hearing about here this week at the conference. How many of you are contending with all five of these? Three or more? Anybody not worried about any of these? Okay, cool. Um, is there anything on this slide that you'd like us to elaborate on? All right, then we'll assume that we're all pretty familiar with what these mean, and we'll dive into uh, some of the unique things about our local context. Uh, about a year, no, about a, three years ago, over the course of about a year, six of the librarians who were doing collections work and acquisitions work at UH left us for their dream jobs elsewhere, which is a lot. Uh, and with their departure, we lost a lot of institutional knowledge and expertise, but it created an opportunity for us to reassess, reorganize, and redefine our approaches to collections. We also got a new dean a few years ago. Um, four years ago, our longtime dean retired, and our new dean came with a fresh perspective and a background in technical services. She asked a lot of questions. Why do you do this this way? Why are you organized this way? What are we thinking about this? Uh, that really helped us take a fresh perspective and examine our structures and our processes. Um, a couple of university level initiatives also had a big impact on how we manage collections. Uh, a university initiative that was implemented about a year and a half or so ago uh, is the desire to increase research output across campus by 50% in five years with no new money. So we're thinking really hard about how we support increasing research productivity with our existing budgets tied up in subscriptions and approval plans. 
And also, we're opening a new College of Medicine next fall. A lot of time, effort, resources, money going into setting up that infrastructure, and of course, that means a lot of new subscriptions. So now that we've got some of the, the context and the background for us laid out, Nancy's going to talk a little bit about our change in philosophy. Thanks, Carrie. So there are a lot of terms that people are using in the literature and in the profession now. We are using the terms moving from a speculative uh, kind of collections approach to a responsive collections approach. Uh, we've also used the terms just moving from just in case to just in time. And uh, the term Lorcan Dempsey, the related term is facilitated collection, right, which he talked about. And actually, as an aside, Carrie's going to talk about some articles and things that we used. And Lorcan Dempsey, as a co-author, we used some of his material in what we worked on this last couple of years. So in a traditional world, our collection development was one where, of course, the liaisons had a lot of, of influence. Um, the, the big roles for them, they make decisions actively, uh, selecting via firm orders, obviously managing the approvals, et cetera, and act as advocates for their faculty when it comes to getting funds for electronic resources. In addition, certainly in our world, our management of our uh, serials collection was reactive. We didn't really, we didn't make cancellations or anything unless there was huge budget pressures. So that's kind of the traditional world we were living in. But now we've shifted to a model where we only purchase in response to patron demand, primarily. So we, we had to agree that we were not going to be a library that collected for the ages. We are just not that. That is not our role, and we cannot do it. So we all had to get on that same page. And we also realized that we had to have collection strategies that responded to new institutional priorities. We wanted to engage in flexible collection strategies uh, to provide access, with the emphasis on flexible. We know uh, that we're going to try things that aren't going to work, and we've, we've all agreed that if they don't work, we're going to abandon them and try something else. So we're not going to get stuck in patterns that just keep going on forever. We decided as well that liaisons, and we used to also use the word selectors. We have abandoned that term completely. Uh, liaisons are going to become consultants around collections rather than decision makers or advocates. And we're going to go into that detail in a minute. And we wanted to implement ongoing assessment of the collection so that we can stay on top of, make sure we're not mindlessly paying and paying and paying for things that are no longer needed. That was really important to us. So this was the first time, actually, that we all sat down and formed this collections philosophy. We had never really documented anything like that before. We were an institution that did not have collection development policies, so we were just doing things as we always did them. And, and documenting something like this gave us the opportunity to be on the same page, because we had to discuss it, we had to share it with people, and it was a really good process. Um, so the restructuring, the actual restructuring, which we're going to talk about, and the philosophy creating was all happening at the same time. So it was a really, it's been a really busy couple of years for us. So now I want to hand it back to Nora and Carrie, who are going to talk actually about the structural changes we made. So as Nancy mentioned, in support of our new philosophy, one of the things that we did was make some organizational structural changes. Um, we merged the interlibrary loan unit, which had previously lived in access services, with the acquisitions department, and it became research materials procurement. Um, research materials procurement does monograph and serials acquisitions. Um, we do licensing and setup of electronic resources. We do interlibrary loan and document delivery. So essentially, if you want a resource, we're the department that gets it for you. Um, we advocated hard for the get it department as our title, but somehow that didn't fly. Um, so the idea behind this restructuring was to gain some efficiencies. Um, there were overlapping workflows in interlibrary loan and in particular in monograph acquisitions. Um, we've got two sets of staffs essentially working on ordering materials, receiving materials, and getting them to patrons. So it seems very silly to have these two separate um, siloed areas working on essentially the same process. Um, 
we fully integrated ILL and monograph purchasing workflow so that all of our ILL staff are also monograph purchasing and receiving staff members who also have um, uh, financial duties uh, with voucher creation and payment of invoices. Um, so at this point, we've got three people and one vacant position who are cross-trained on all of those tasks. Um, coming from Access Services, ILL had a strong uh, patron-centered background. We've always been very responsive to patron needs and had a direct connection to the patron that I think sometimes acquisitions doesn't get as much exposure to. Um, we had brought with us this culture of cross-training, having scheduled backups, people who did the work when the main person was out, um, and basically just a shared team environment. There were certain tasks that were always available to the team for the team to work on. Um, acquisitions was a little different. Um, they tended to be a little bit more siloed. There were individual experts who knew the process inside and out and had done it for many years. Um, but potentially when they were gone, there wasn't really anyone else who understood the process um, and could back them up effectively. Let's see. So um, having gotten that depth from the cross-training and system of backups, obviously this is a big culture change for both groups kind of coming together. Um, and some staff can feel very threatened by sharing that knowledge that they've had control over for a really long time, um, especially those who have worked for a long time in that one area and feel like they've worked years and years to build up this pool of knowledge. Um, so to help engage those people in the change process, we worked really hard from the very beginning to overtly value that expertise and to call them out as experts in their area. We reached out really early to have conversations and ask a lot of questions about what they do, what they value about what they do, um, and what are the pain points where we might work on making it better. Um, change is often driven from the top down, as you guys know, and as this reorganization was, but um, engaging staff members in that process can really give them back some of the feeling of control that they may have lost. Um, so we wanted to make them feel invested in the change efforts. As I like to say, we give them the destination and then let them make the roadmap. Um, so we tried to create this team environment where suggestions and uh, discussion about improvements were welcomed and encouraged so that people could approach either myself or now the assistant department head to talk about anything that may not be going well in their particular workflow and brainstorm about new ideas. Um, this particular merger was the right one for us, but in thinking about your local context, um, one size doesn't necessarily fit all. So as you think about what kinds of changes you might see at your institution, you think about your structure and your people, where your overlapping or similar workflows might be, what internal talents you already have that you could tap to fill a need the way that we now have interlibrary loan people purchasing monographs, and how might you be able to structure around that. And now Carrie's going to tell you about liaison services. So we completely blew it up and rebuilt it. Uh, we restructured uh, around functional team base, uh, functional teams, and we have a number of liaisons and functional specialists who work together to meet our evolving campus priorities. So you can see the teams are color coordinated here. On um, your right is the green team, uh, the outreach team, and that is comprised of all liaisons and uh, and a coordinator for outreach. The purple team is the instruction team and they've got a mix of functional specialists and a liaison. The blue team is our research services team and there we have another, it's a pretty big team, and we have a mix of liaisons and functional specialists with our data services and our research data management librarian. Our collections team is smaller intentionally. Uh, we have just Nancy and a liaison slash functional specialist. And then we have a couple down at the bottom who don't belong on a team but work very closely across all four teams to hit graduate services and open educational resources. Uh, so this is our structure. It was very different from our previous structure and uh, we're, we're continuing to evolve it two plus years in. Um, but this has led to a lot of changes. Uh, we spent a lot of time thinking about the role of the liaison, what that looked like, how that would evolve, how that needs to evolve, what we need to put in place to make sure that evolves. Spent a lot of time on that. Uh, and collections is one of the responsibility areas where we made some significant changes. Liaisons no longer spend their time purchasing. 
They don't have pots of money that they're responsible for. They don't collectively or individually spend down our budgets. Um, they're not faculty advocates. They're not owners of collections. Rather, they provide input to the decision makers and they talk to their users about collections from a library-wide perspective rather than a disciplinary one. Uh, we also increased expectations around research support activities and more meaningful information literacy activities, which means that instead of, instead of developing our collections, they're focused on collaborating with faculty to use our collections. So they're working with faculty to embed them into the curriculum and to promote collection services that enable faculty research workflows. So, um, all of these organizational changes necessitated a new decision-making structure around collections. In the past, we had what we called the Collections Management Committee, or CMC, which was largely a represent representational body with members from across the library. Um, as a huge group, they met monthly to make decisions about new subscriptions and purchases. Um, and it was kind of assumed that current subscriptions would continue to be renewed until there was some sort of financial prerogative to cancel them. Um, so, the need for more flexibility and speedier decision making led us to the creation of the Collection Services and Management Committee, or COSMIC. Um, COSMIC includes the Associate Dean for Public Services, uh, Carrie, the Head of Liaison Services, Nancy, the Coordinator for Collections, and myself, the Head of Research Materials Procurement. Um, COSMIC considers all requests for new subscriptions that we get. Um, we discuss strategies and directions around collections generally. Um, we consider cancellation recommendations that are sent to us by the Dream Team, which I will talk about in a minute. And we try to take into account the political landscape at the institution, which shifts very rapidly, um, university priorities, and other big picture things. Um, so we try to be keyed into the general sense at the university and focus on how our collections can um, follow along with that. Dream Team, or the Data Driven Resource Evaluation and Assessment Metrics Team, which might be a backronym. Um, works more on evaluating currently subscribed resources before they're renewed. So we've been working with our databases list and we're going to be transitioning into our journal packages and big deals. Um, what we try to do is evaluate based on available usage data, in particular cost per use was one that we focused in on. Um, we also try to gather contextual information about why we subscribed to a particular title, who originally requested it, who uses it, and for what purpose, for teaching, for research. So we reach out to uh, liaison librarians who are working in those areas to try to gather that contextual information and document it so that we have it in the future. Um, this year, working with that process, we've canceled around $100,000 worth of resources. And now I'm gonna hand it over to Nancy. Okay, whoa, that's not right. Okay, so these are some of the things we are doing at UH. Um, you'll see things on there, I'm sure, that you're already doing, but we wanted to share the mix of things that we are. Um, some of them, one of them in particular, as you can imagine, was a huge uh, disruption to the status quo, print DDA. Um, again, as the new dean was here, and we were looking at the way we were doing things. Uh, we were looking at monograph circulation tanking uh, year after year and our need for continuing funds for continuing resources increasing. So what we decided to do, like some other libraries are doing, is go to print DDA for monographs. So what we did, we, we took our, um, we worked with YBP, we took our approval plan profile and instead of getting books, those records just come into the catalog every month. And we set up a request system, which uh, was going through Iliad, so that requesters could request anything they wanted, and we would certainly get it for them because it fit the profile. And I think we are, we didn't verify this, but it was about 25% um, of what we were spending before for approvals or for monographs, something like that. So we've really brought down the cost of monographs. And again, we were okay with that because we're not collecting for the ages. We want to be responsive. We want to get what people need when they need it. Um, the second thing, time-limited subscriptions. We decided we do not want to just, when we get a subscription, we don't want to subscribe to it forever, right? So we want to review new subscriptions every three years to see if they're still needed. 
One of the cases that it really worked well this year was we got a new re a request from a history professor and when we went back to them, time limited subscriptions require that when we get a request and we're considering getting it, we need to go back to the uh, requester and say, okay, tell us about your need for this. Because in one case, their need was, I'm working on a six month, eight month project with one of my graduate students and we need access to this. And, the, and so we only need to subscribe to it for a year. And having gone back and determined that, that's what we set up the subscription for, one year and it's gone. So we are looking forward, as we get more subscriptions uh, requests, that there might be more opportunities to do those short-term things. We've also entered into some cost-sharing arrangements with some of our departments. Uh, the College of Business has been a big one. We currently have five. Um, agreements. Uh, those do require some uh, work, of course. We have to have MOUs with those departments. NORA's group handles those MOUs so that everybody's on the same page. What percentage is going to be paid for? What are we going to do every time it comes up for renewal? All those details that go with that. They, we, they've proven so far to be really useful for uh, resources like data resources or resources that only certain uh, departments are going to have access to. And we found that when they, certainly when the department has more skin in the game, they are much more responsive about the usage and about all these other things and how much they need it. So we, this has been really successful so far. Article on demand, um, probably everyone would say they use that. Currently, ILL, we use reprints desk along with Iliad for document delivery. But what we're going to be looking at more soon is uh, unmediated article delivery. We really are interested in doing a lot of that, and we just haven't gotten to quite that yet. And as Carrie mentioned, or Nora, that we're, we're going to be assessing our big deals and our small deals. And another thing we want to look at is all the access fees we're currently paying for all these one-time orders we have that don't, or one-time resources that we bought with end-of-the-year money, that never have gotten a lot of use. And we want to look at that as a project because we are paying a lot in access fees. And when you multiply that over years of access fees, we've got to figure out what we want to do there. If, you know, if we need to continue owning these things or not and making them available. So given this list of what's going on at UH, uh, we would kind of ask you to think for those things that you're not doing, which of those really makes sense to you, for you, in your, at your institution? Are there things on that list that you would like to take home and say, approach somebody, who would you need to approach, whose buy-in would you need to get, what, what would you need to do to actually start some of these new initiatives? Um, if you're looking for flexibility in approach, if you're looking for just reducing your costs, how would you go about it? And that's what we'd like you to think about in terms of what we're doing. So a lot of the changes, um, wait, that's not actually yet. All right, well, let me try that again. Uh, <laughs> So uh, a lot of the things that we've done have been pretty intentional, but some of them happened and actually had more of an influence on uh, the evolution of our strategy, like our restructures. Those happened and then we built them into our planning. Um, one of the biggest challenges with any re-envisioning uh, has got to be generating buy-in. Right? One of the big things that was helpful for us was to get the dean to be a champion for this initiative. Uh, she was visibly invested in the changes. She communicated about the changes frequently and consistently. Having her champion that really clarified the level of priority and signaled to the whole library about the vision and the direction for collections. And we worked very closely with her and with library administration to make sure we were all on the same page and that the messaging worked for them uh, as well as for us. One of the other things that was essential in our change management strategy was engaging the liaison librarians. There was a lot of change for them. 
uh, and we had to make sure that they were um, on board and involved. So some of the ways we, we did that were to engage in a discussion of various readings. Nancy mentioned um, the Lorcan Dempsey and um, Malpas uh, article and others like that. And we would just, you know, meet regularly and have a discussion on readings. And we made sure to invite Nora and some folks from her department and see where those discussions led us, what concerns and what questions came up, and deal with them and revise our strategy as we went. We also um, drafted a collection statement, which was new for us, uh, and got liaison input on those drafts uh, and revisions. And as part of our departmental reorganization, we drafted a Foundations for Professional Practice document that outlines the activities and responsibilities for our department. And of course, Collections has a piece in that. Uh, and of course, we're drafting a lot of external messages to faculty, to their community, getting the liaisons to help with those, to provide language, uh, feedback on that um, was essential in getting their buy-in. Nora talked a little bit about the cross-training and skill building that happened in RMP. Uh, and one of the other things we were doing is targeting stakeholders in the library. So we spent some time at our uh, library leadership team talking about questions and concerns around this initiative, uh, have had a lot of conversations one-on-one -on -one with other department heads, and we've visited a few department meetings to make sure that they're on board. And then, of course, we spent lots of time planning and talking to faculty. Uh, we've been intentional and strategic in how we've done this. We've carefully crafted messaging um, and shared that messaging internally, making sure that we're all using the same talking points, whether it's the dean or whether it's a liaison or whether it's me and Nancy meeting with faculty members. Uh, the dean has been talking with the other deans, with the provost, with the president, helping them understand our budget scenario, the rising annual costs of scholarly publications, uh, how that connects to open access and open science. We've also been targeting select faculty. Our strategy thus far has been to build buy-in and understanding with key early advocates so that we have a good chunk of folks on our side as we roll this out more broadly. So the dean's been using her faculty library advisory board. We've been work working this into conversation through faculty senate's executive committee or the research and scholarship committee as they talk about open access um, issues. We've also been meeting with small groups of faculty, especially around things like PDDA and other changes we've made that impact them where they have questions and concerns. We've gone to department meetings, we've met with chairs, things like that. Um, and then we've taken our, our faculty champions, our library advocates, and we've tested our messaging and our strategy and talking points with them and revised based on their feedback and their questions and their concerns. And we're now at a point where uh, we're ready to roll this out more broadly on campus and very soon we'll be launching a new website and press releases and open forums and really ramping up our communication and messaging strategy. So I'd ask you to think here too about who are your stakeholders, both internally in the library and externally on campus. What are their needs? What are their values? What do you need to consider in terms of getting them on board? What strategies do you need to apply? Um, and they'll be varied, and there was a lot of spaghetti thrown against the wall to see what stuck, so. Yes. Okay. So, um, a slide about some of the things that we have learned through this process. There's way more than we could possibly fit on a slide, but um, as Carrie mentioned, um, we haven't gotten quite as far as we wanted to with rolling this out to the larger campus. Um, we're kind of just gearing up to do that now. Um, sometimes life happens, and one of the things that life brought us was that we implemented a new ILS in the past year, um, and so that brings us to lesson number one. Be careful of taking on too much change all at the same time. Um, you have to be aware of competing priorities or other projects that are going to absorb people's bandwidth and attention, because that's a very real limitation. Um, lesson two, communicate more. Um, you're never communicating as well as you think you are, and this is true for us. We're in this every day, um, so it's really hard to see where other people who aren't engaged actively in it are, are with the information uptake. Um, 
we've tried to have our key talking points clearly articulated and ready to go. We've got our elevator speeches. Um, we've got a very intentional message that we're trying to communicate consistently. Um, but still, no matter how often we do it, it, it doesn't seem to be enough. Um, so you should just do it more anyway. Um, one thing that really brought this home when we were doing the slides for this presentation, I had a colleague come into the room um, just to go get coffee, and she said, looked at the title and said, revisioning collections? What are you doing around revisioning collections? I didn't know you were revisioning. Um, and she did, because I know I sent her emails about this, but she's also been hip deep in an Alma migration, so I can understand why it kind of passed her by. Um, so that goes back to number one, don't take on too much. Um, you need to plan for emotional attachments. People are very emotionally invested in their work, I know that I am. Um, so you have to allot some time for actually addressing emotional issues and discussing them with people one-on-one. -on -one. Um, just know that that's gonna be a roadblock. Um, when Print DDA was implemented, we had to very carefully manage the communications that went out. Um, we still had, even though we had a very carefully crafted message, we still spent a lot of one-on-one -on -one time with faculty and visited departments to explain to them that this wasn't attack on, an attack on their discipline per se. We were trying to support them better. Um, I know today's academic library is so much more than collections. We have instruction, research support, study spaces, on and on and on and on. But for most of your campus community, the library equals the collection. So whenever you make change in this area, know that it's especially sensitive. Um, you have to make a plan for slow adapters. There are, back to that emotional attachment, there will be people who aren't excited about change. You need to know that and engage with them. You need to try to tailor your strategy to deal with them. Um, whether that looks like working with them personally, um, taking their feedback and changing your plans, or just trying to get some backup from your higher ups. Um, speaking of higher ups, one of the best strategies we did employ was having the dean um, out in front as a very visible advocate for this change initiative. That was something that worked very positively for us. Um, involving people seems like a gimme, but um, again, the, the earlier you can involve people in that process, the more on board they're going to be. Uh, particularly some of the slower adapters are possibly just people who need time to absorb things and reflect on them and think about them and integrate them into their world blue. So the, the sooner you can have them involved in that process, the better. This also gives you the opportunity to um, get their feedback. Um, and finally, we wish we'd talked more about our milestones and spent more time celebrating things. Um, celebrations are a lot of fun, everyone likes cake, but um, they also help to keep us motivated, the people that are actively working on the project, and people that aren't, it keeps it on their radar. So they have a positive association of this thing that happened, and then they're aware of it. I got cake, we're changing collections. Um, so that should definitely be a part of any communication strategy. So um, that is a little bit of our story, and just a little bit, because honestly, we could probably talk about this all day. Um, but here are some questions that we kind of thought of for you to reflect on as you're thinking about any change initiatives you might want to make around collections. So what are the deeply held values of your organization, both at that university level, at the library level, in your liaison unit, um, and your staff who are working with collections? And how might you make changes in a way that engages with those deeply held, value, held values rather than alienating them. Um, you have to think about your local factors. Um, in liaison services, most of our folks had been there a relatively short amount of time, and so they were like pretty ready and willing to engage in a change process. Um, in acquisitions, that was a little bit different. We had people who had been there 25, 30 years, and while we did have some people who enthusiastically got on board with the changes, we also had several people who opted to retire. So. Um, Think about what role your liaisons are currently playing in collections, or if you even have liaisons, um, and where would changes leave them if there are people who are heavily invested or in work around collections? And then what role should your administration take? For us, it was a very positive um, step to have our administration out in front. Maybe that's not the case at your university, so think a little bit about it. Um, of course, how are you gonna engage with your campus community? What are the most effective means of reaching your people, your researchers, your students, your faculty? And how will your faculty react? Try to figure out who, which departments are gonna be your pain points and um, get with them earlier and have a strategy ready for dealing with them. And with that, we will see if you have any questions for us.
and we've been asked everyone to use the mic since the session is being recorded. I just love all of this, especially a dream team that's inspired name. Um, related to the dream team, you mentioned specifically use CP, uh, cost per use. What other data, overlap analysis, what other kind of data did you use when you make those renewal decisions? Let's do it together. Okay. Um, cost per use is kind of our factor we're using to flag things, and then we try to dig a little more deeper once it's flagged. We arbitrarily pick $25 as a threshold for cost per use to flag it for, and we may evaluate that later. Um, we take a look at usage data of all kinds. Mostly we're pulling uh, counter one reports, but... Right, and uh, usage on libguides as well is yes, another piece that's right. we're looking at. And we know that CPU is controversial and all that stuff, so we don't necessarily think it's the best thing, but we needed to launch this and get it started. And we actually, uh, based on CPU, we grade it red, yellow, green. And so something that web of science is green, we're not gonna be looking at it, canceling it, whatever, but things that are yellow and red, we wanna look at a little bit more closely. Yeah. So when we're trying to use CPU as sort of that, that flag, and then we do a more intensive, um, yeah. qualitative review based on every information source we can find once it's flagged. Hi, I'm Tom Carroll from Franklin and Marshall College in Lancaster, Pennsylvania, a much, much, much smaller institution, but we're dealing with some of these same important issues. Uh, I have two quick questions. With the print DDA, somebody sees a book in the catalog, says, oh, good, the library has this. And, oh, now you've got to wait. What's the turnaround time for getting that book for the patron? So when we launched the service, we said that our goal was to get to a seven-day turnaround time. Um, we have not yet achieved that. We're hovering somewhere around eight and a half days on average, um, and we've been trying to figure out alternative shipping solutions for that. Um, but we do try, what we've, we've used Iliad as the request platform, so we've tried to build in some communication during the request process to let them know um, what's happening and that this item might take a little bit longer. Um, interestingly, again, I could talk forever, but if, you, uh, if we break down all of the statistics about where it takes the longest, our shipping time is the part we have the least control over and the part that takes the longest. Like, we're basically kicking butt anything we can actually control. But. And with the merger of interlibrary loan and acquisitions, would you sometimes borrow the book through interlibrary loan instead of purchasing it? Ideally, I would like to get to a point where we're making those kind of evaluative decisions, um, but we're not quite there yet. I don't think that we have the data to know um, I guess, how to query the user to discover what would be the, the correct response. Okay, and let me sneak in a third question. I, I didn't hear you mention anything about e-books. Is that part of your collection, part of the strategy? Yeah, we have, we have some e-book collections, and we also have an EDDA plan um, that we've had for eons that predates any of this revisioning, so it continues to be robustly used. Okay, good, thanks. Hi, I like all of this. Um, regarding the changes to what liaisons were responsible for in their role and all of that, um, did their job descriptions change? And therefore, did the evaluation procedures change? And I'm thinking through our librarians who are faculty, did promotion guidelines change? Um, not really. <laughs> so we haven't hired a new liaison since we made these changes, so we haven't um, posted a new liaison description yet, uh, and we haven't gone back and officially changed any of the liaison job descriptions. They're still responsible for, I think the line we've last used was collection management. Um, so you could perhaps argue that that still factors in. Um, and then the second part of the question. Oh, um, and annual performance review. Uh, we just implemented our Foundations for Professional Practice document last spring, uh, early spring. So that is going to play into conversations around annual performance review and some of how goals get set uh, in the upcoming year. But our cycle is January to December. So we haven't yet had a chance to bring those conversations into play. But it, 
the way our APR works is there's no set line for collection specifically, more of a job performance category as a whole. 